We've got another evildoer story today, and that is the story of one Eric Kempka. And I am going to say these names and places like an English speaker would, because Erich is way too much effort for me. <laughs> so Kempka grew up in an area called the Ruhr, and he was a member of a group called the Ruhr Poles. And these were people whose ancestry traced back to Poland, and their families had moved to the Ruhr to work in the mines and work in the industry that was found there. And so Kempka came from a working class background. He was from an urban area. He was from the Catholic uh, tradition. I think it's also fair to say that he was not highly educated. And it may also be fair to say that he was not highly politicized. And all of these things will come back into play later when I start asking you questions about what you think in terms of his involvement with Nazism during Nazi Germany. But it, uh, we should say, I think, that those are not uh, the characteristics of uh, typical hardline Nazis who tended to be uh, more educated, more rural, more Protestant, and so forth. Now, Kempke started his adult career uh, with a company called DKW. And DKW was a car maker that later became a part of the Audi company. And he worked there as a mechanic. He became involved in Nazism very early in life, and his first real notable position within the movement was as the driver for uh, the sort of like the governor of the Ruhr area, a guy by the name of Joseph Terboven. And Terboven was a real hardliner, and uh, it was through Terboven's recommendation to Hitler that. Uh, <laughs> that Kempke actually came into Hitler's sphere and uh, interviewed with Hitler and uh, got the job as a backup driver starting in 1932. And Kempke drove all over Germany during the 1932 election, uh, kind of along with Hitler's entourage as, as Hitler went around the country speaking and so forth. It wasn't, till, it wasn't until 1936 that Kempke became uh, Hitler's primary driver, his number one driver, and that was upon the death of a guy named Julius Schreck, who had been Hitler's uh, primary driver up until 1936. Now, as Hitler's only driver beginning in 1936, there's a couple of interesting things to note here. Uh, the first was that he always drove Mercedes, and uh, that was a Hitler tradition. Hitler was extremely fond of Mercedes vehicles and had always ridden in a Mercedes from way back in his earliest political campaigning days. Kempke was also somewhat of a short guy in stature and those big Mercedes really, uh, they weren't built for, for shorter people. So he actually had to sit on something like, kind of like a child seat. <laughs> I mean, it was basically just an extra, an extra bit of height in his driver's seat. Over the nine years that Eric Kempke drove Hitler around, uh, he noted a couple of uh, kind of, I guess, interesting things about his boss. Uh, first of all, Hitler was a big participant in these drives. Uh, oftentimes he would have a map that he would kind of read the map and kind of see where they were going and plan. And uh, Kempke also noted that Hitler always liked to pass cars that were in front of them. So if there was ever a car in front of them, uh, even if that car was going pretty fast, Hitler would insist on passing them. <laughs> so <laughs> the last kind of interesting thing that Kempke notes in his book, um, which is not that great of a book, it's pretty short, it's, it's not written by a person who knows how to write books, but he also noted that um, Hitler would sometimes bring along snacks and he would uh, share a snack with Kempka to make sure that he, uh, you know, he had something to eat on these long drives. Blah, 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 nine years of driving go by and uh, by 1945 when World War II is coming to a close, Eric Kempka is, you might say, a minor big shot. Uh, not only does he have regular access, personal access to Adolf Hitler, uh, but he is by then a lieutenant colonel in the SS, and he has uh, quite a few people working for him. He has 60 people that he is in charge of who are uh, backup drivers or entourage drivers, as well as mechanics. And in his fleet, by that time, when the war came to an end, there were uh, 40 Mercedes cars. And uh, as the war w wound down in the spring of 1945, 
Hitler was living in his final residence, which was a, a bunker in Berlin. And as part of that sort of complex there, there was an underground garage where Kempke kept these 40 Mercedes. Now, unfortunately for him, uh, they pretty much became destroyed by artillery fire as the, as the Russians closed in around this bunker. Uh, they, they lobbed a lot of artillery fire over that area. The, uh, the roof of the car garage, the underground car garage collapsed, making all of these 40 nice shiny black Mercedes unusable. On April 30th, 1945, Kempko was uh, in the area there of Hitler's bunker when he got a call from one of Hitler's closest uh, personal attendants and bodyguards, a guy by the name of Otto Guncha. And Guncha was very upset and excited. And what he told Kempka over, this, over the phone line was that he needed a lot of gasoline, as much gasoline as Kempka could possibly find. And so Kempka figured, well, you know, we've got all these cars in this underground garage that are unusable. So he put his staff to work, uh, basically siphoning all the remaining gasoline out of the tanks of those Mercedes. It was when Kempka and his staff delivered all of that gasoline a short distance to the bunker that he found out the whole purpose of the uh, gasoline, which was that Hitler and his, uh, his significant other, and very recently his wife, uh, they had gotten married uh, just a short time before in the bunker, uh, Hitler and his wife had both committed suicide, and the purpose, of course, of the gasoline was to try to uh, cremate their bodies to the extent that uh, there, there wouldn't be anything left and you know he couldn't be uh, somehow taken off to Moscow and put on parade or something like that, which was one of uh, Hitler's big fears towards the end of his life. So Kempke is right there immediately following the suicide of Hitler and Eva Braun, uh, Hitler's new wife. And he witnessed Hitler's body being carried out of his uh, little room area there and up the stairs out of the bunker and Kempke also witnessed a guy by the name of Martin Bormann carrying Eva Braun, Hitler's new wife, out, uh, out of the room where they had died. And Kempke had, uh, had known Eva Braun to an extent. They were at least acquaintances, if not friends. And uh, he took uh, Eva Braun's body from Martin Bormann and, and carried that up the stairs because uh, he just he knew that uh, Eva Braun and Bormann didn't get along and Bormann was kind of a was pretty much a creep. So um, Kempke carried Eva Braun's body outside, placed it next to uh, the body of Adolf Hitler, and he and a couple of other uh, folks, Otto Guncia among them, uh, doused those bodies with gasoline and found a way to get them to ignite. Well, with his boss gone, all of these people that are left in the bunker are very much wanted people, and they decided rather than wait for the Soviets to show up at their doorstep, they needed to try to get out of the bunker and somehow get out of Berlin, which was completely surrounded by the Soviet military. And so they developed a plan by which different groups would try to leave the bunker in the middle of the night. And Eric Kempke was among one of those groups that attempted to essentially uh, not only get out of the bunker, but to escape Berlin. And the short version of, of Kempke's escape, which was actually successful, uh, amazingly, but the short version was they went essentially down into the subway tunnels near the bunker. They came up and walked along Friedrichstrasse to the north until they came to the point where you'll find the Friedrichstrasse uh, train station uh, that was there then and it's there now. And at that point, that was essentially the end of German-held territory and across the bridge to the north, across the Weidendammer Bridge, was the Soviet military. So a, bit of, uh, a battle kind of broke out there as some German tanks tried to support this group that Kempke was in, tried to support them in crossing that bridge to the north. And uh, the tank that Kempke was walking next to got hit and exploded and uh, really tossed him and others uh, into the air like they were little rag dolls. 
that really rung his bell and after a little while uh, kind of trying to recover the group walked along the railroad tracks toward what is today Lairter Station, train station, and along the way uh, they came across a building where there were, there were some uh, foreign laborers there and those uh, Yugoslav uh, people that were sheltered in that building actually took it upon themselves, or one woman among them took it upon herself to try to hide Kemka from the Soviet military and essentially she helped him uh, escape Berlin through her uh, through her efforts and through kind of vouching for for Kemka and it's really unknown as to why she would have done this we can speculate all kinds of things well the point is that amazingly Kemka was one of only very few who actually made it not only out of that bunker but out of Berlin he did of course eventually uh, come to the attention of, in this case, American authorities and uh, he was taken into custody. He was really heavily interrogated once they figured out who he was and he was one of the key witnesses who told American uh, interrogators about the death and about the circumstances of Adolf Hitler's death. Now we come to probably the most interesting part of all this because I want to know in the comments what you think about it, but the American authorities interestingly decided not to uh, charge Kempka with any kind of crimes. They uh, interrogated him and they uh, used him as a witness against others, but Kempka himself was never, um, never really convicted or even tried for anything and the U.S. authorities seem to have taken the, the approach or the view that Kempka was not a political foaming at the mouth type of SS officer like most SS officers were. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, most of your super uh, loyal to the last minute type folks would have been SS officers who oftentimes they came from um, more of a rural background Oftentimes they came from more of a Protestant background. Oftentimes they came from more of a middle class and more of an educated background uh, than Kemka. And so Kemka was kind of the opposite of all of those factors that you oftentimes find in these super loyal uh, SS officers. Kemka's loyalty to Hitler, it seems to have maybe come from kind of like a... Um, there are people or personalities who really need to belong to something and they really get loyal to whatever they whatever group they belong to and Kempka's group and Kempka's person was of course Hitler and Hitler's uh, political movement and you know uh, it's like when you when you there are crappy companies out there, right? And there are also lots of people who work for those crappy companies who when you tell them how crappy their company is, they'll, they'll try to defend it. And they'll get all offended that you would say something like, man, your company really sucks, you know? And those are the kind of people I think that Kempka was, where this was his group and he identified with it, he belonged to it. And I think that's where a lot of his loyalty came from as opposed to more of the political philosophy behind what was going on, which is what most typical SS officers would have uh, had in terms of driving their extreme loyalty to Hitler and his movement. One big mark against Kempka and this interpretation of him as a sort of uh, not really a political Nazi would be that following World War II he did attend he attended several meetings or gatherings of former SS officers and uh, you can imagine the kind of uh, discussion and conversation that would be taking place at these meetings of which Kempka attended and so we do have to ask ourselves once again was he attending these meetings because you know, he really just liked the feeling of belonging to this group, even if he, uh, you know, didn't really associate with their views, their detailed political philosophies, or did he fool us? And was he really that foaming at the mouth guy who really believed in the details of, of uh, the, that movement and who was able to not only fool American authorities, but also perhaps uh, fool uh, the people who have done a little bit of research on him that does exist.